I've never, no, I've never watched it back, ever. Ever? Never. And because you can't? No, because I, I knew what I did wrong. All, all of this and all of you is a very positive person that embraces adversity. What was that whining rubbish that you wrote in the mail? It's an interesting point, because actually it, it, you'd have not enjoyed the original article if <laughs> that's the one you saw. <laughs> okay. um, because obviously with all our columns... Was it even a longer whine? There was a longer whine, yeah. So in football, if you make a bad tackle, you think, actually, ref, I think that's a red, I'm off. Well, I've only given you a yellow. Nah, I'm off. Spirit of football, well done. This is Up Front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So with this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up to proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way. And more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, one of the greatest bowlers this country has ever produced. 604 wickets taken in Test cricket, with over 150 of those against the famous foe Australia. A World Cup winner and four Ashes victories to his name, an English cricket icon. Stuart Ford, welcome to Upfront. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you, Stuart. I think, I think I'm right in saying that I met your dad a few years ago. Um, it was in a boardroom of Queen's Park Rangers. Okay. And Nottingham Forest were playing QPR in a game. Right. And uh, he's a formidable character, you're dead, isn't he? He'd have been wearing bright clothing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for, he's sort of half Forest fan, I think. Now he lives in Nottingham. Is that right? Not quite as devout as me, but... Uh, oh, you're a devout Forest fan, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I think so. Um, Stuart, one of the first things we do when we're talking to guys like you and all the guys that have been on before is try to establish what brought you to the career that you had? What made you become the person that you are and specifically and explicitly in your achievements as a cricketer? And it's been sort of leveled under the moniker of what is your why? Coming from a background where it almost feel like it's priced in. You know, your father was a pretty significant cricketer. Mm. What, what, what drove you? What made you? What let, I mean, was it, was it a, a natural progression that you were gonna become a cricketer or a sportsman of sorts? Yeah, good question. I, I think uh, obviously having the inspiration of of dad having played for England was a, a, yeah. a huge thing. Um, I look back at being very young, and there were there were videos of his success in Australia in eighty six, yeah. eighty seven, and you know, most kids are watching Postman Pat, and there I'm watching the cricket. You know, mm -hmm. so there was a there was a an inbuilt uh, love for cricket straight away. But I, I don't think that stayed with me throughout certainly my teenage years, I dwindled slightly on, on the cricket front with just exploring loads of, loads of different sports. So if you'd have asked me at 15, am I going to be a professional cricketer? I'd have, I'd have said no chance. You know, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't big enough. Uh, I, I wasn't skillful enough. Um, but I had just a, a real tweak at sort of you know, 16 and a half, I had a growth spurt and I, I, I fell back in, in, in love with, with playing the game and, and didn't look back from there. But, but my, my inspiration for wanting to have a successful career was was probably built through a deep competitiveness. Yeah, you know, I, I loved sport, any sport, and my mum was crucial in making sure I played loads of different sports. You know, well, I was going to ask you that because I read a uh, an interview that you and your partner did with Tatler, and you talked about the biggest support structure that you had was your mum. Mm. And that surprised me. Now, it may be because you can qualify it for me, but I would have thought the biggest support structure, if cricket was going to be your career and you, what you were going to excel in, would have been your dad. Yeah, I, I mean, mum and dad got divorced when I was three. So right. dad went off to play for, for Gloucestershire. We stayed in, in the sort of Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire area. So probably didn't spend, well, I didn't spend every day with, with dad like I did right. with mum. But I think mum's mindset for me was something that embedded throughout my whole playing career about enjoyment and I, I, I'll always remember arriving at, at, at sports fields and it doesn't have to be just cricket I played a lot of hockey I enjoyed rugby and there'd be kids already out there in the nets like hitting balls there'd be kids already like working hard uh, before the team time or before the coaches arrived and I remember looking at those kids and they lacked a little bit of in, like love of the game or inspiration right. it just felt like a bit of a slog even at 12 or 13 and I never had that because mum's mindset was always enjoyment so I, I'd get in the car after a day's play of cricket if I got no runs dropped a catch you know no wickets it would be have you had fun have you enjoyed it because 
it, it, and that I think with that being her first question to me, it embedded in me that you can have a rubbish day on the playing side, but still love it. And a lot of my teammates at a young, influential age of you know, 13, 14, if they had a bad day, that was a bad day. Right. If your performance was bad, well, there's no way you can enjoy the sport. Whereas that wasn't how my brain was was developed with with my family. It was, well, sport's amazing. You're there with your friends, your teammates. Yeah. You're there to enjoy it. You can score no run, runs. You can score no goals, but you can have a great day. And and that definitely stuck with me for 90% of my, my international playing career because ultimately my number one goal was Enjoyment, but you're not. Yeah, but you're not a participant. I mean, Matthew Letizia said the same thing. I tried to uh, uh, sort of extrapolate from him why he stayed at Southampton and what was it all about and what was his modus operandi. And he said the biggest thing he wanted to do was entertain and enjoy. Mm. And I thought that he was going to say the biggest thing I wanted wanted to do is win. I want to mm. win. I'm in the business of winning. That's what I do. And you know, not to put words in your mouth, but you don't strike me as being someone that values the participation. You value no. the outcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I've had a really interesting journey throughout my playing days of of that because, yeah, I, I think it's important not to value the outcome in your teenage years or in your you growing really? up. Yeah, I think so. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I wasn't listening to the school teachers that said the result doesn't matter. You know, it's all yeah. about just being here and, and yeah, enjoying it. participation award, yeah. It was all about, you know, making sure I put in performances to help te help teams win. But I, I never felt the pressure of results because that comes with professional sport. It's mm -hmm. all about that. And if you can't cope with that, then you fail. But when you look, when, when someone trots it out and you'll get it trotted out all the time when you do interviews about these statistics, about the level of your achievements, when you look back on the journey that you've been on, are you, are you surprised at the level of attainment and success you've got no. in your career? You're not. No, because once I got within the professional sport arena, the changing rooms, the, yeah. the the pressure of it. I loved it. Right. And I wouldn't say I could notice differences in in different teammates of who would who would want the ball at certain times or yeah, who would who grab would the ball, it, who yeah. wants the game. Yeah. But even when I was making my Leicestershire debut at, at 18 or I was I was fully in. You know, I was I was gonna take I was gonna have a battle with a 35 mm -hmm. year old at the other end. I was gonna get stuck in. And if after three or four games of professional cricket, I had a buzz in, in me that I, this, yeah, I've, I've trained throughout my teenage years to enjoy and to have fun and be relaxed. And it all be about, you know, if I am to make it, it will, it, it will just come. I don't need to force it. I don't need to do right. loads of hours extra. I just need to be relaxed. And then when I got into the professional arena, there was something that sparked in me that, this is right. when I can lift my game. Like this is when I can jump, uh, take my game to a next level. Because I've got the best coaches around me. I've got teammates that are very experienced. Pick up everything from them. Like grab information all the time. Yep. And my learning in those two years was more than I learned in 10, 12 years of playing cricket before that. And it was the best type of learning because it was the learning that makes a career out yeah. of it. You know, it was the learning that that you know, I, I had an upbringing playing for Edgerton Park Cricket Club and Melton Mowbray. That was exactly what a, a, a club cricket side should be. It was there was a barbecue would go on after the game. Right. Uh, the players would have a few beers after. You'd play a bit more cricket with the kids, and you'd you know it would be a real like family atmosphere. Um, so I ha I'd already that that enjoyment of playing cricket was sky high. But then when the professional side came along, that edge was what I loved. Do you have any? When you're beginning, your engines are going and you're starting to build towards a, a, being a, a professional cricketer and you're getting those opportunities. Were you always, I mean, you speak to me, you speak as if you were very relaxed, you, you come across very relaxed and you're very, I wouldn't say laissez-faire about your approach, but it seems very easy and very you're very composed about observing on what you did in the past. Did you have to build that level of confidence? Did you have to build that belief? Did you have demons? Did you have challenges? Did you have crises of confidence? Or did you just think to myself, when I've arrived, I can just see myself building all the time? I can honestly say, so what, I played for England for 17 years and I had horrendous days and brilliant days. I never held on to any bad feeling for more than 24 hours. Right. Really. I, 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 I was... I had a unique ability to have a really poor day, yeah. wake up the next day and that be completely gone, which is very different to an individual sport, I think, very different to a boxer who's been knocked out, 
and then their next fights in five months you've got that sort of time to try and get yeah. over the the experience uh, and or dwell on it, it. yeah and, and i think that that helped me i don't know if that's a natural thing that was in me but i never remember feeling awkward about stepping on a cricket field i never remember feeling um like i didn't belong there it was always what end of my bowling? Like, give me the ball. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take on this batter now. I'm gonna get him out. Right. But bear in mind that's coming from a voice that um, got hit for six sixes as a 20 year old yep. in a World Cup. We'll get that. To yeah. So, mm -hmm. so that that's as big a knock as a 20 year old. A 20 did you treat Cup. both? I mean, for the for the Rodyard Kipling expressions, did you treat both imposters the same way when you were when you take eight wickets in a game, yeah. or, or you paid really badly? Do you take each one in equal measure? You don't get despondent and you know, broken by a poor performance or a set of circumstances that have adversity and you don't get elated and euphoric. hundred percent. Yeah. You've yeah. got that. And, that, and that's, that's been a, that's been a, a crucial factor in my mindset throughout my whole career because I have, yeah, I get taking eight for 15 against the Aussies to, to mm -hmm. win the ashes, regain the mm -hmm. ashes at Trent bridge, my home ground. It's sort of dream stuff. And now Absolutely. I'm, now I've moved away from the game. I can look back on that with incredible fondness. That's a moment. Yeah. But doing it, I never sort of sat down and was like, yeah, like what an experience. Yeah. It was like, well, what have I got next type thing? And and that sounds a bit sad to say, but that is professional cricket because the games come so thick and fast. Yeah. If you if you dwell on what you're doing, and bear yes. in mind, this is something I've learned over a long period of time, you know, around that 2007 period where I just started playing international cricket in 06, floating around a little bit, thought, uh, you know, thought life was pretty good, Pro young professional sportsman at 20, 21. Um, I, I didn't get it all right then, but then it took something like the six sixes that I had no answer to, mm -hmm. to go 24 hours later. Okay. That, well, that's, that's the last time that level happened to me. Yeah. That, yeah. that, 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 that feeling of unprepared, being unprepared, uh, floating into the game slightly. You can't do it at the top level. Were you feeling that when you were bowling, when you bowled the first one, it's gone for a six. You bowled the next is no, so six. Do you Are know you what? sitting there thinking, shit? No, no, I, and and honestly, um, I I didn't. I had no like mental connection to it, and that's what have, worried you me. You must have all. had dread, Stuart, when you got to the fifth six, and you're sitting there coming into bowl the last there ball. Must there must have been a bit thinking going, this is going or stood wrong. Stood there going, fucking hell's going on here. But so interestingly, when I look back, so I've, I've quite a, I've I've always had quite a structured routine. A lot of people call it superstition, but right. for me, it, it's I do the same routine every day in preparing to bowl a spell. Right. Because whether I'm bowling it in front of 100,000 people at the MCG or 25 people uh, in a club game, yeah. I know that that process helps me deliver the same yeah. result. And that was uniquely, um, it was a T20 game that South Africa had played just before us on the same pitch, T20 World Cup. So when that happens, you flip straight onto the pitch for your 10 minute warm up before the next game starts. There's not too long a break between TV. So we didn't have much of a warm up. And I ran out of time to mark my run up out. And I knew that I was bowling the other end to start. Right. So I marked that run up out and I didn't have time to go down to the end that I ended up finishing on. So I, I get given the ball in the 19th over with very little experience of bowling at top level batters at that late stage, at, that, at, at, at uh, bowling at the death they call in cricket. Mm. And I had no run up out, marked out. So I'm there like so that's flapping in your around. So, so like, that, where's that's, my a, that's in your mind already. Yeah, yeah, I'm striding out. So immediately, as soon as my my mind is now not thinking about delivering skill. Right. It's now thinking about I'm out of sorts. how am I even going to like yeah. run up yeah. here? I don't know where I'm running from. Uh, and that was a, so forget, I've, I, I've sort of forgotten what happened in the next 10 minutes as to why did it happen? Why it happened because of that preparation. And an interesting way that I've never, you know, I've never watched it back, ever, ever, never, and because you can't. No, it was a Just deliberate no. decision because I, I knew what I did wrong. Right. I knew that I tried to repeat in the six balls. I tried to bowl the same ball again because I didn't get it right the ball before. Right, but I was just chasing my tail. Right. I should have gone. Well, I'm going to try a bouncer now because obviously the Yorker's not working, and. Um, you know, and that's that. That sounds an easy thing. Oh, well, you just don't look, search it on YouTube or anything. But actually, every time, like if I'm in India in the hotel room, an advert comes on, it might be on, or a T20 mm -hmm. World Cup, it's on, and I've always just turned it off. And and that for me is 
has held my mind quite strong in the fact that I know what happened. You know, I mm -hmm. remember when I first started playing, Sachin Tendulkar said something like, I don't, I don't read the newspapers because I don't need someone to tell me tomorrow mm -hmm. what I knew today. Yeah. And that resonated with me because I knew what I'd done wrong. And I, I didn't know how to fix it straight away, but I knew I had to put strategies in place to, to strengthen my mindset. I remember waking up the next day, we're in Durban. And, and ultimately for me, how I connected it, it didn't knock us out of the World Cup. Did you feel embarrassed though when, you, when, it, when it yeah, happened? Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I was you know, a young lad with mm. long hair, highlights, thinking I've cracked international cricket and I've just been, a lot of players wouldn't even come back from that yeah. sort of situation. One thing that was really important was we went, we flew straight to Sri Lanka to play a one day series. So it gave me a chance to look forward and go, okay, what did I lack here? I lacked a routine. I lacked certain balls to get me out of trouble if one ball isn't working. And I, I remember being so energetic to going straight into what's my next move to improve me as a player. Whereas I'm sure a lot of players would have just folded underneath folded in, in a hole and never wanted the ball again. And um, from there, I created a mentality about uh, a, a, like a mentality structure that protected me throughout my, the rest of my career. My, mentality structure, what do you mean? Yeah, so I, I created this thing called warrior mode, which I can right. talk a bit more detail. But I remember my dad, when I was 15, said to me, having played, well, he played 25 tests for England, mm -hmm. professional sports, 80% mental, 20% mm -hmm. technical. Yeah. So, you know, if you're working as a 15 year old, yeah, work on certain things, but know that the top level game is, it's a mentality. Yeah, it's in there. Yeah. But now I've played for England for 17 years and moved away from the game. I call bullshit on that, actually. I reckon it's 90%, even 95 Oh, you think it's even further? Than, I think it's further. Yeah. yeah. Because just watching the all the players that have had longevity in cricket and been successful, it's all mindset. So for me, I had this thing called warrior mode that I built from this period of suffering uh you know very badly on the international stage at cricket knowing i had to improve and i just built a mentality around me that that looked after me in precious scenarios and then actually when i'd grown that mentality over a period of time i sought i sought precious scenarios i wanted the pressure i because i knew right. that i had something to protect you me. could thrive and survive on it is it heavy the shirt in t I don't mean literally, I mean wearing it and playing for England with the pressure and expectation. Was that a transition never, and a feeling that... Never that thought about it. Never thought it was way. heavy. Because some people say wearing a particular shirt, if it's a numbered shirt in a football team, it comes with a weight of shirt upon it and playing no, for England with the expectation. It's, it's a great question because I, the feeling that over uh, overrided me when it, Sir Ian Botham gave me my test cap. Right presented to me, which oh, of course I'm like, it. wow, yeah. Ian Botham, you know, play with my yeah. dad, dad loves him, yeah. like legend of the game. And he handed it to me and it's got a little 638, so 638th player to mm -hmm. play test cricket for England. Yeah. And a lot of people, when they get that cap, it's a dream come true. Mm -hmm. I've worked my whole career for this cap. And it's here. Yeah. I didn't have that feeling. It very much felt like I need to create memories in this cap. I'm not here to wear it once. I'm at here that, to- what, at 19, 20 years of 20. age, you had that thought. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I was like, the cap, what's the right way of saying it? Of course, it didn't mean nothing to me, but I got it and I wasn't like overawed by it. I was like, this is mine to go and win series in now. This right. is mine to go and win games in, which is, I, I can't think that many players ha think like that. No, I don't A lot of players do. probably go, wow, my family are going to be so proud. Yeah. What an experience. And of course, my family are very proud of me. But, I immediately switched it on to performance. I was like, I need to go and create memories. So yeah. over time, like I always- yeah, But I think that's right as well. I think, yeah, I think that's a good attitude. I think that's the right attitude because you're there because you deserve to be there, but you'll only stay there if it's what you do next. Yeah, yeah. And I never, I didn't want to just play one game or play yeah. for a year. I knew that I wanted to be good enough to, to move the team forward and ultimately win the Ashes was a, a massive get goal of mine having my dad done it in, in 86, 87, mm. that I never set really specific individual goals. But of course, having gone through all my influential teenage years, England not winning the Ashes from 86 to 05, it was like mm. a deep burning fire that mm. I had to win an Ashes with England. You've played under a number of captains, you know, from Michael Vaughan, Andrew Strauss, Alistair Cook, Joe Roots, and obviously Ben Stokes. Who do you think got the best from you and 
why? I mean, stats-wise, Ben Stokes got the best from me. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll talk about him in, in a bit of detail later. But to answer this question specifically, uh, Michael Vaughan was my first England captain of, of in the test match stuff. And he get, he gave me amazing responsibility, which helped me settle pretty quickly. He didn't. He wasn't the captain that came. Being what when you say gave you well, he he didn't come to the end of the mark and go, "This is your field. This is yeah. where you're bowling. You're going to do this. You're going to do that." He was very. It was a conversation which helped me. Ultimately, I've I've got to be the one to deliver the ball. So there's no point me trying to deliver a ball that is designed for someone else's thinking. I've got to be comfortable with the field. Uh, and he wanted me to grow as a player. So he he was like, take responsibility yeah, for that. Gave you a I'm here. I'm at mm -hmm. mid-off. I'm stood here. I'm five yards away. If you want to change the field, go for it. Yeah. And that was a great uh, start in Test Match Cricket because it made me feel like I belonged. It you made belonged, me yeah. feel like I could go and, and dominate the game. And if I got a feel for something, I always had a pretty good tactical brain because I loved the sport. I watched loads of it. So I could always, I was always brave enough to, make a tweak to the field. Um, whereas someone like a Straussy came in who took us to number one in the world, but it was a very different type of feel. It was more, this is how we're doing it as a group. We're going to go under 2.7 and over as a group. If you don't go under 2.7, right. you won't play. Fit into this way of bowling and batting and deliver it. Uh, and and that I still did pretty well under Straussy. We said we got to number one in the world. And one thing Straussy did to me is he backed me as a player. But it's a very different but style. But did you not like that? I mean, that 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 sort of homogenous thinking, which is we as a group have to be under going under two point seven and over. Did that not sit with you? As well, looking as back perhaps? now, I don't think I enjoyed it as much as other times in my career because I like having that freedom of of just going to try and take wickets, and mm. if it costs you a few runs, it doesn't matter. But it was bloody successful. Like we as a group, so it really hurt a, a bowler like Stephen Finn, who had amazing attributes but would bowl bad balls, so he didn't play. And actually, if Stephen Finn was 23 now in Ben Stokes's environment, he'd play every game because his mindset was bowl wicket taking balls. Mm -hmm. So that it, Strauss's was the most consistent team I played in because the goal was consistent every single time. Determined you score 400. Yeah. Yeah. You do it in this way, you take 20 wickets and you do it by building pressure and being relentless and right. training was relentless and you're judged in training every day. Whereas Stokes, he's come in and said, don't care about, about run rate. Whatever you concede as a bowling group, we'll score more. So don't right. worry. If you go at four and over, we'll bat at six and over. So chill out. But at every mind, every time you take the ball, Stokes, he goes, how are you taking a wicket? So pre-think, how are you taking a wicket in this game? And that was really refreshing as a 36-year-old to, to finish my career playing in an environment where runs don't matter. Pressure doesn't matter. If you get hit for four, don't care. Wickets. Yeah. And um, that was a pretty cool way to, to finish up because it was so free. Ben Stokes, I mean, he's, he's been on a journey. And, you know, I was an observer on some of the travails he got himself into off the cricket field. And I don't think that was particularly impressive. But he's gone. Did you ever imagine that that what the journey that Ben has gone on to where he is now as a captain would produce the outcomes and the sort of rapport? I mean, his performances have been remarkable and that helps the battle, doesn't it? But did you ever see that and think that this was going to be the journey that he went on? He's always had that amazing ability, like that follow me ability that you have in teammates. You know, if he if he stood up in the change room and said, I'm going to do this, you'd be like, I'm going to do the same. I'm following you. I'm going to go, and, uh, I'm, you know, I'm with you. Did I think he'd have the outstanding leadership capabilities that have taken the team where they have in the last two years? If you'd have given him leadership positions at 23, we wouldn't be talking about Ben Stokes being one of the best England captains of... Of all times. time. Of all times. Okay. Well, I mean, it's very, very short. You yeah. know, he's only done it two years. Yeah. But his influence on the group has been exceptional. And and sport, a lot of the time, is about the timing of things, isn't it? So Brendan McCullum coming in. Well, I'm going to ask you, because obviously that's the key component, isn't it, to some extent. But the changes that McCullum made, what are the specific changes that have been made that you've seen and been party to? So... 
they've done it in a way. So cricket's a stats based game, and yep. you know we'd lost seven. Uh, I think we'd won one out of seventeen in the previous test match before they came in. So a lot of it was about results, and professional sport is. So they've come in, and basically said to the group, they never mentioned the outcome of the game. We have to win today. We have to win this week. Yeah, it's never even a, a, a thing conversation, that, a conversation yeah. that's come in. And subtly, over not that long a period, probably over a month, they started building players up to take the positive option at all times. So, right. so Baz would always say, people that have bought the ticket for today, uh, we're competing with people who want to go and watch football or the theatre or the cinema. So give them they something to watch. Give them something to watch. Yeah. And, and if that is, you can entertain this crowd better by in 10 balls, by hitting... 25 and a couple of great sixes than you can in trying to bat for three hours and plod plodding around and then nicking one to first slip. So if you have entertainment as your number one team priority, right? then let's see where that takes us. So I remember in, a, in the first test match that he took over at Lords, Johnny Bairstow came out and got 12, I reckon. Hit two great cover drives, but 12. Might be 15, whatever. End of the day's play, Baz is just doing his little roundup. And he goes, I just want to mention, guys, Johnny, what a knock. Those two cover drives, the way that you changed the atmosphere in the crowd, yeah, you the, way that, you the way that you walked out there with your chest out, it was like, I'm going to come and entertain you. Yeah, yeah, you got a good ball, it bowled you, you were back in it, doesn't matter. But that mindset of going out to, to change the momentum and entertain is, is everything that we want this team to be. And he's backed players. I mean, one thing that we had 56 changes, I think, in the last 12, 13 test matches before Stokesy and Baz took over. Baz came in and said, well, you're going to play. I, I, you know, you're going to play the summer. So just play and enjoy. And and the, the comfort that gives you as a player to go and express yourself, knowing that you can make a mistake, but you're going to play next week. As long as you play with that mindset again, that you're taking the game forward, is, there's a lot of strength in that. So that takes away doubt. So when you're out in the middle yeah, and you think, oh, I'd quite like to hit this for six. The, I, most of my career in change would be like, oh, well, you shouldn't do that. Because if you get out, yeah. the, the momentum will yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas actually the mindset is, I'm just going to hit it for six then. So at uh, um, where it really became very obvious to the group was at Trent Bridge in test match number two of Baz's reign. We were chasing you know, what it would have been, 250, 260 in a short period of time at Trent Bridge. Quick outfield, nice pitch. And Johnny Bairstow and Ben Stokes are batting at T, come into the changing room. Ben Folks is in next. And Ben said, Ben Folks said, if we lose one more wicket, Baz, are we going for, blocking for the draw? And Baz went, everyone in, everyone come in. So all the staff are in, everyone he goes, um, just so we're really clear and on the same page, I don't believe in draws. They're not a thing. Mm -hmm. We're going for the win at all costs here. Even to the last man. So Jimmy, when you get out there, try and hit boundaries, try and score runs. The, the draw is not in our mindset ever. People aren't, haven't bought tickets here to come and watch a draw. They want a win or a loss. And I want us to chase that win and go for the win. And if it fails, we'll pick ourselves up. But this must have been like manna from heaven. Ben but, Stokes so we were like, wow. characteristics, wasn't it? So then... So then when it becomes reality to the players, because words are, you know, we've yeah, all heard, in, yeah. you know, loads of nonsense yeah. in our time. Johnny, go, we go out after tea and Johnny faces the first ball, bouncer from Matt Henry, and there's a, set, a field set for bouncers and he ducks it. And Stokesy walks down to him and goes, Johnny, what are you doing? Well, I was just having a look at a ball. Don't. Hit it for six. Mm -hmm. Next ball. Yeah. And then he went on this rampage and got 100. So then we're in the change room after and Johnny's saying, oh, well, Stokes came down and said, what are you doing? Yeah. Why Don't leave the ball. You can't score runs leaving the ball, hit the ball for six. And then we just grew with this like mindset that we'd all be not egging each other on is the wrong idea, but it is like, go on, go and do something special. Don't care if it's for five minutes. All, all of this and all of you is a very positive person that embraces adversity and takes things on and accepts the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. What was that whining rubbish that you wrote in the mail? Which bit? <laughs> the, the whole article where you talked about 
the idea that you were blindsided, that you didn't feel it was fair that you well, got left out. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I read it at the time and I thought, oh fuck off, mm. you haven't been picked, and I'm sure you're Why disappointed. Why was I not picked? Well, I don't know, mate. But in life, we don't always get what we want, <laughs> and you have have shown in this conversation and through this, the length and breadth of your career that the one thing that you can do is overcome adversity. And so when I read that newspaper article, I thought to myself, why would you write such a thing? You're like one of these entitled, what, entitled sportsmen. What bit because you haven't got you what, particularly? The whole, well, from kit to caboodle, from the, first art, from the first part of the article all the way through, I didn't think there was one part of it that was particularly redeeming of the sentiment and characteristics that you exhibit in this conversation. Mm. Because you have been hit for six sixes, not succumbing to that. I'm going to deal with that, and I know the reasons why. You're going to say, perhaps, I didn't know the reasons why. I knew the reasons why I got hit for six sixes so I could fix it. But this sense of I got spoken to for five minutes and I didn't really get much sense of it and and I hadn't dropped my standards and et cetera and et cetera. And it felt like it was beneath you. It's a private thought. It wasn't a winning mentality to air that. It, this is my view. And mm -hmm. you're going to smack me around and tell me that I'm wrong, right? Or whatever. But I read it and I don't recognize it for the person I watched. Mm -hmm. And I don't recognize it from the person that I'm sitting across and listening to, them to talk about their career. So I was disappointed to read it because it doesn't feel like it's the utterings and mutterings and splutterings of somebody that can overcome shit in their life. It's an interesting point because actually you'd have not enjoyed the original article if that's the one you saw. <laughs> okay. um, because obviously with all our columns... Was it even a longer wine? There was a longer wine, yeah. So all our columns have to go through the ECB to get sort of sign-off when you're an ECB contract. This went through the ECB, did it? And that's what came out. So imagine what it was prior to... <laughs> it, was the, it was the most crossed out column of, of any England player ever, I think, because it was just right. a red mist. It was a red mist column of, yeah. of how I wrote it. And looking back now... Um, no, actually, do you know what? I have no, I have no regrets of saying how I felt because ultimately I felt pissed off that at that stage I thought my England career had been finished by by a decision maker that I felt had no right to make that decision. It was a statement decision. Being Drop who? me and Jimmy. Why? Being who? Well, the decision maker was Andrew Strauss. Yeah, I know. I know. I... So um, the the I felt like it was a decision made on. How can we make a statement that we're trying to move forward? Right. And the the bit that upset me was a, yeah, I got a five minute phone call after what I thought was sixteen years service for the company, um, and I was replaced by people that weren't better than me. I didn't think that I. I think but the England, but, but, but the England but with, should always be earned. But with respect, Stuart, that's not your gift, is it? That might be your thought process. And I have regularly had this debate about the entitlement of athletes within the confines of the space, because ultimately, if you want to be a decision maker, put yourself in the position where you are a decision maker, and people are going to make decisions that you don't agree with. But if someone's so made... a good point, because that's exactly what I did. So I learned a huge amount from that, because I... what, that, what that taught me was, is, is my England career going to finish by someone else just saying, I don't think you're good enough to be in this team? So what I, I did from that moment is I changed my whole mindset about, right. about um, taking responsibility away from the ECB, taking decision-making away from the ECB. And ultimately in professional sport, what? well, ultimately in professional sport, you are, your, response, your career is in the hands of others because a co new coach comes in, we've seen it football all the time, new manager comes in, doesn't fancy that player, they get moved on even if but, they're But fantastic. ultimately in the end though, and that's a, a fair analogy, but ultimately, and people come in with preconceived notions and perceptions, and then if you are very good at what you do, you would be able to change the mindset of a coach by the very nature of your performance. But so I, are you saying that you changed your performance to affect the outcome, or, or, or what is it that you're saying that you no, changed? I, 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 so the coach been sacked from uh, the England position, Chris Silverwood. Right. Uh Asher Giles, who was director of cricket, had been sacked. So Andrew Strauss had come in as an interim director of cricket until yeah, someone remember. was yeah. until someone was appointed, and then that director of cricket would then appoint a coach. So I suppose where my red mist came from is who is an interim director of cricket who's not going to do the job in two months' time, 
to drop me and Jimmy okay. when we're fine performers, still yeah. delivering. Um, and it was probably a frustration of some decision, decision making that had happened over the past sort of two years previous. Well, uh, I don't, and, I don't I was also at the stage I where I thought my, English, wrong. I thought I, my I England career was over. So I was a bit like, fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care. I, um, cause I don't think you're wrong to have the thoughts that you had. I was just, it does, it doesn't. So you prefer to read the sports, the sports players articles that are mundane and boring. No, 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 no. Oh, right. I prefer them not to be so self-entitled <laughs> uh, and to have the, of what I would consider be, we all suffer outrageous things in life. I have to read shit about the time I had at Crystal Palace and I have to get on with it and I accept it and I price it into my thinking and I go on and do other things well. And I looked at it and I thought to myself, I don't disagree with the principles of what you're saying. I disagree with your method of delivery, mm. which is it read like a childish, whining, entitled sportsman, unhappy with his lot. That's that's probably right because it was very raw. So it's a, that's sort of within the week of me but finding I'm amazed, out. But then but you're telling me that the ECB let it go through. So that bit. Yeah. I mean, my 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 column, my original written column was worse. Oh god, yeah. What else did you say then? Uh, now I have to know. Well, uh, I'd have to research. I've, I've certainly remember getting an email back that yellow meant I couldn't say it and that 80% of it was yellow. Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that was. Well, did a, you personalize things? Did you take it into a space where you said this person didn't have the right to do I took this? I it probably took it into a space yeah. where I thought I was never going to play right. for England again. So I didn't really care. Um, and probably a bit critical of the decision makers saying it. If you'd have, if you'd have been, say, if Andrew Strauss had been in the job for two years prior, yeah. and been around and seen and gone, it's not working. You'd have swallowed it more. Fine. Yeah. Don't that my my upset came from you're in the job for three weeks. You've made a massive call to make you look like you're doing something, but it's the wrong call. And ultimately, it was. It, ultimately, I can yeah. sit in now. I haven't had my whinge. Um, <laughs> it saved my career. Right. It saved my career. Me and Jimmy because. Right. If we had gone to the Caribbean and been a part of that of loss, yeah. then the new coach and Captain Mike come in and go... Would have had the go, grounding to say, you're a lot of you. We're yeah. done. Yeah. So I, I look back now, um, with it changed my mindset to free up and actually just enjoy it. You know, you don't know, you don't know when your last day is. Stop looking so far ahead. Just enjoy what's in front of you. And Which is ironic because that's the process that you've followed in your career mm. from from delivering a ball you've not it, gone for the outcome you've gone for yeah the process and it was entitled the, the, the thing that upset me was and me and jimmy because jimmy was the same jimmy was in the car park of his picking up his kids from school we'd played for england for 15 16 years been hugely su successful and i what upset me was i felt like a decision maker that had no right to gave us five minutes of the Even time though he'd been your captain yeah but being a captain is very different to being a an interim but the respect that must have been developed under that period of time for his judgment but that's why i felt like the judgment had been a letdown right i thought it was a poor decision um and i'm allowed to think it was a poor decision you're allowed, to think, if you're I allowed it, to think what you want if yeah. i thought it was a good decision I'd be, i'm in the wrong game right um i think i think every not publicly necessary but every player who gets dropped should question why uh, and oh, oh well of so course I, absolutely i, I agree got with no that. answer that yeah. was what Frustrated. Really set you off, did it? So right. if you if you if you're a director of cricket and you come to me and go, look, Stu, you you dropped because X Y Z. Fair enough. Like you've that you that's your decision. You've made that call, and actually, I can't argue with your points. But don't don't come to me. And go, you dropped. Why? Mm. We're gonna have a look at someone else. Why? Well, one day you're gonna be in a position. See, I I kind of agree, and I disagree, and and I'm not gonna beat you to a pulp with my view on this object on this subject when matter. you sat managers were you did you were you to the point facts or was it a feeling gut feeling don't give me gut feeling we're not in a business no of gut no feeling. it was it, and i also didn't feel the need to give them an explanation either mm. and if they'd have been if they'd have asked me for an explanation i would have said it's self-fucking evident what you're saying is it's not self-evident it wasn't self-evident yeah I, I understand that mm. but there's also this other side of me that can't help but price it into my thinking that like i hear players well all i got was a five minute phone call well what do you want then you want two hours of someone's time. People are busy. They've made a decision. They, they're prepared to own that decision. They're going to be accountable for that decision. And they're going to have to live with the consequences of it. But he wasn't going to be accountable. He was, because wasn't you think he's an interim job. guy. Yeah, but it would still be. Anyway. Am I winning this argument? 
I think I think you are. You are. I understand. No, but I understand. No, no, no. But I understand your point, and I understand more yeah. about the uh, why about, upset about me. why you upset why yeah. upset you, and and I would have felt that you would have sought out somebody rather than the public domain to do it in because oh, the public domain well. is no. Yeah, I'm not sure you did because mm. the public domain twists and turns based upon it. And if, they, if they'd have gone to West Indies and won, then your article would have looked even worse for you. And so it happens. It was probably it was a perfect storm for you. I was probably at the understanding that I was I wouldn't play for England again. That's how I felt, having been dropped from a tour. Very defeated, Stuart Broad, not representative of your attitude. Full stop. But I did. I played again. You did indeed. Um, This spirit of cricket argument that's raging around at this moment in time for obvious reasons. I mean, the producers said, "Is this notion all bollocks?" Which is a lovely way to express it. But the spirit of cricket and the culture of cricket. I mean, do you believe in it? Um, what is it, first and foremost? I was hoping you were going to have a definition because I've got no well, you're idea. You're the ones that play it. I don't know what it is. Uh, I, it's an interesting one because I, I got embroiled in a spirit of cricket argument when I nicked the ball and didn't walk against I was Australia. Ask you about that. Was it a family trait, isn't it? Well, yeah. It's a trait of 99% of professional cricketers. To be is honest. it? Of course it is. Name me a player who nicks the ball and walks consistently. I don't know. Good. Argument over. So no story so, of cricket then? He, well, so I got So what you like getting all in, aerated about then? I well, mean, I got with, with the Australians. We'll get to that. I got embroiled, right, in a spirit of cricket. You nick the ball and you should have walked off. So 21 players out of 24 in 10 test matches nicked the ball and didn't walk in that period of time, in that two Ashes series. But as a bowler, what do you think then? If someone Let the umpire it, make a decision. Do you? Yeah, genuinely. You don't that. go, you cheating bastard. No, you no, don't think well, any I of might that. say that to him, but, uh, you know, I'm a big... I actually would say, is it not more disrespectful to the referee? So in football, if you make a bad tackle, you think, that's your ref. I think that's a red, I'm off. Well, I've only given you a yellow. Nah, I'm off. Spirit of football, well done. Oh, yes, but football doesn't profess to have that. There's no. this culture of cricket where you've described it in a very different way. You know, you've talked about the, the, the cricket that you played and the family events and people going around to people's barbecues and it was the real cricket when I was younger. That's not uh, spirit of cricket. That's just but that's enjoyment the, but, of But cricket. that's the essence of cricket. And then it translates into a spirit which is about how people should play. Is it a... a do, do, it's okay. Is the spirit of cricket myth really centred in just a British view of the way that... British sport I think it's should world, be played. I think it's worldwide. I think it's the spirit of cricket. I don't. I, I wouldn't call it. I think. I don't think anyone necessarily knows exactly what it is, because I broke no laws or rules nicking the ball and not walking, and and I did exactly what ninety nine percent of professional cricketers do, is nick the ball and not walk and let the umpire make the decision. Right. That's what frustrates me about that sort of blow up of around that instance. I think the Johnny Bairstow run out at Lords is a very different thing because that's bad form, isn't it? It's bad form potentially, but it's actually I viewed it as the wrong decision to give him out because if you break that down, it's a weird dismissal. He wasn't seeking you, you don't an advantage. often see that. He wasn't uh, seeking an advantage. There was no advantage being right. seeked. And also, if you pause the ball, the if you pause the telly when the ball hits the stumps, one of the umpires has got his cap out ready to give back to the bowler. Yeah. And the other one is it's, walking to his mark with the head down. It's dead in most people's minds. So dead. Right? Yeah. So I think, I don't think that's necessarily a spirit of cricket decision. I think it was just the wrong decision to give him out. I think they should have said that was the end of the play. The, are there, there are certain sections of the media and observations from certain pundits about Johnny needing to pay more attention to what he was doing. Was that an opinion in the dressing room? Was it not an opinion? Was there any reprimands no. or did everyone galvanize around? We gal it galvanized it made the series, yeah. to be honest. We galvanized around it. I think he didn't do it again in the series. No. So he he realized Concentrate his mind. maybe I've, you know, yeah. was a bit dozy at a time just wandering yeah. out. But I don't think anyone would have thought that the Aussies would have taken that as an opportunity to to run him out at the end of an over. It wasn't like he was doing it to try and nick a run. When I was watching the game live, I thought there's no chance. Really? I didn't think the Australians would. would so, because I, I was down. next in at Lords in the changing room, I stood up. So I was like, "Oh God, if there's an appeal, I might be in here. Start like stretching or whatever." Saw it on the TV. Nah, nah. no way that is that out. Sat back down, and then I heard a huge boo. I was like, "What's happened there?" And I think Baz went, "I've been given out." I thought like, you're joking. So I'm. I was like, "Am I in?" 
yeah, yeah, you're in, mate. Yeah. Helmet, like, so I'm scrambling around a bit like, right, get it. And what set me off was I have I walked through the long room, which is normally like, you know, good luck, have yeah. a great time. And one of them just, one of the members was looking out the window and just turned around to me and goes, absolute disgrace. I just had red mist for 10 minutes. Really? So I walked past Johnny and normally when the out batter, you'd go, what do you think? Is it swinging, mate? Are you feeling like, you know? You it, just it, He was just snorting, like staring at the floor, like, like a raging bull, didn't even look at me. And that revved me up as well. So I was like, okay, well, so he's obviously annoyed. So as I'm walking out to Lords and there's booze going at the Aussies, the captain, Pat Cummins, is coming on to bowl. So he's walking towards me to the end of his mark. And I just looked at him and I said, yeah, that's, you're an absolute disgrace. And the response was? He said, oh yeah, you're hardly a upkeep of the spirit of cricket. Did he? Reference in 2013. Yeah. So that upset me right. a bit. So then, then the next 10 minutes became of me being very facetious and mm -hmm. shouting in every yeah, time. I saw you. And, yeah. Which I, I had huge regrets about that night. I was hugely embarrassed about it, but I had no real control over no. what I was doing. I was just, you know, there's a moment where Silly Point and Short Leg are in with the helmets on and the crowd are singing, same old Aussies, always, always cheating. cheating yeah. And I am stood there a yard away and I'm looking at both of them in the eye, just singing, same old Aussies, always cheating. And they can sit there looking at me as if say, what are you doing? And Stokesy came to me and said, I'm going to do my thing. I'm not going to talk. If I run, you run. If yeah. I run two, you run two. But you keep doing your thing. And I did. And I just, so Pat went over to Long On, like way away from me. Even the crowd are booing him when they walk back. And I'm shouting from, you know, what is it? 60 meters. Pat, Pat, all these boos, they're for you, mate. All of them, they're for you. To the extent where I think some of them are going, just like calm down a little bit. Started off as a red mist and then I tweaked it into an advantage of mm. we've got them by the balls here a yeah. little bit. How long can I make this carry on? This rivalry of Australia, it obviously means something and it has intensity attached to it. One of the observations before or during the series and maybe even up to that point, I think Michael Vaughan made it, was about the friendliness between the sides and the amicability mm. about it. And he was basically, I think, saying was enough of this now. You know, this is the old enemy. We need to see a bit more intensity, a bit more dislike. And I suppose that leads me into the question about, w was it a catalyst first and foremost? Did it get everybody at it a little bit more than, did it, did it heighten the sensitivity of what, what we're playing against here? These guys will fucking stop at nothing to win. They don't yeah. care. And 100%. they're going to do whatever they have to do. So we better start up in our game or we better start distancing ourselves from any kind of relationship with these people because it's hit there to be won. Did it change? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, galvanise the series. I think yeah. it, it uh, I, first and foremost, I think for English people watching or supporters of our team watching, it, it, um, it actually got more people in, not just the cricket fans. It wasn't just the cricket oh, fans Christ, watching yeah. England. Front Australia. page and back page newspapers, wasn't it? This was bang. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, everyone's in. You know, you, know, you know in sport, you know it's a big thing when prime ministers are commenting, you know what I mean? So, it's, uh, you know, it got to that stage. Yeah. But it also, us as a group, we weren't we weren't talking about that in our in our change room. We weren't going, oh bloody Aussie's doing that. But there was a steeliness added. There was a grit. There yeah. was a mindset. There was okay if they if they're going to do if they're going to play like that, then, we're going to play with yeah. our skill and yeah. our intent. And we'll be, we're also going to yeah. be hard as nails here. I'm going to read you something which is interesting because I can relate to it. Not not quite forty thousand. I had twenty five thousand Birmingham fans sing this to me. Yeah. Um, when I was at Palace because I made some observations about Steve Bruce leaving Palace to join Birmingham. What was Birmingham good for? Nothing. What was the last thing they won? Nothing. What was the road out? What was the best thing about Birmingham? The road out. Yeah, um, but you had enough, this. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was pretty fair until I rocked up there. Um, you had this. Not many people can say they've been called a wanker, by, as I just said, I can, by 40,000 people simultaneously, can they? By the end of the tour, I found myself actually whistling along to Brody as a wanker. It almost got stuck in my head, quite catchy. When you when you when you hear that quote back, does it take you back to that space? 100%, I can feel it now. Does it make you laugh? Did it make you laugh at the time? Did it? it did it? Did you think crying out loud? What's going on here? The noise shocked me. It, it doesn't didn't make me laugh at the time. I had to be really like have a real steely um, battle face to cope with it because it was it was proper warrior loud. mode. Yeah, well, to to a, almost to another degree, it was like. I felt like it was me against Australia. Um, and I had to have that sort of siege mentality for that period of time because 
wherever you go in Australia, it's Australia versus England. It's not the Australian cricket team versus England. Mm. You know, you go to restaurants and you get, oh, I brought you your shit. Oh, thanks, bud. Yeah, I'm just having a steak. I'm just trying to enjoy a meal. You know, so it's, it, it, it's, uh, but I love that. I, I love how much they love their sport over there and how much they're too. into their yeah, sport. Yeah. But you know, when you're going there, when the head coach, the Australian head coach, Dan Lehman, called out for Australia to like, make me go home and cry or something, didn't he? I think was the quote. I had to prepare for it. Um, but when that first announcement of Stuart Broad came up on the announcer and I had the ball in my hand, I was like, oh my, oh my God, <laughs> that is so loud. But I trained for it. I'd done a little bit of work on preparing for it. And what I didn't want to do is walk down to the boundary's edge and have them chanting at me and just hide away. And yeah. so I thought, well, it's going to happen. I've got to embrace it somehow. So I started to become the conductor you know, doing the sounds and like, come on, I can't hear you over there. Yeah. Come on up we go. And ultimately how I, a couple of things happened to me on that trip that, that rang true. I read Sir Alex Ferguson's book. He talks about Vieira going to Old right. Trafford and the crowd used to get stuck into Vieira. And he said, as a Manchester United manager, I saw that as a greatest sign of respect because if the crowd don't care about you, they're not going to be bothered about it. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. So Which meant thing, something to only me. Only one thing worse than people talking about is people not talking yeah, about it. So, yeah, so yeah. I, I connected to that a bit. Does it fill you with a great sense of achievement being the leading wicket taker against Australia? Because it's a sort of, it's the blue chip, it's the, it's the benchmark. What I treasure are the moments in games that have changed that momentum that's yeah. helped us win that. So what the 150 wickets against the Aussies, that's, patting me on the back for saying you've got good longevity. That's not telling me that I'm better than bowlers that have been previous. I've just played for longer. Did you have any compunction about bowling balls that would hit batsmen? Did that ever float into your psyche? I, I no. don't give a shit. I mean, they, they, opposition bowlers tried to hit me and did yeah. a lot. But so, you as a bowler, did you have that hostile streak in you that yeah. you go, yeah, I'm going to... Yeah, I, I never bowl chin. a bouncer. I never had the mindset to bowl a bouncer to hurt someone. I had a bowl, I bowl bouncers to change the mindset for the next ball. Yeah, set them up. So that was the yeah. set, it's the setup. Yeah. But I'm still aiming to try and, aiming around their, sounds awful to say, I've never really yeah. said it before, Life but I'm aiming up. around the yeah. head because that's the one that will then affect yeah, the next ball. The next ball. Yeah. If I bowl one four foot away from them, yeah, they're, going, in oh, a they're in a comfort zone, yeah. yeah. Uh, and to, like, obviously I wasn't as quick as some, certainly past 25, but I, to, to explain the, the pace of it, I remember being at Brisbane, Mitchell Johnson was bowling, I came out to bat, so I'm revved up. I'm like, yeah. I've got energy in me. I'm like, Phew. and I just chatted to Ian Bell, who'd got out 10 minutes prior. He was a fantastic player, a lot of time, averaging nearly 50 in test cricket. I said, oh, anything to look out for, mate? You know, you know what's going on out there? He goes, oh, there's a sheen on the pitch and he's bowling really quick. I, was, I must admit, I was just struggling to see it. So I'm thinking, Jesus, if he's struggling, if he's that good and he's struggling to see it, what am I going to do? Me, yeah. So I walk out and he's, you know, Picture Mitchell Johnson in the peak of his career. He's got this big moustache. He's grown from November. He's got snot all over him. He's spitting everywhere. And he runs in and I'm like psyched up, like pumped up for the pace. And he bowls me this bouncer and it clips my metal earpiece. So we have the grill across our face and it clips the edge of my metal. And that was the first sign I had of it. It went dink. I was like, oh my God, that is petrifying. Mm. I would hope that would tell the, the listeners what it can be like yeah. at top level sport. The, the, I, I'd played it for 10 years already probably by then, but I still went, what oh, the hell was that? Oh yeah. God. Yeah. Kevin Peterson. The situation with him, I always felt Kevin, um, the, the emotion he invokes in me insofar as there's any relevance to my emotion about it was one of division. I felt mm. that he was a remarkably talented player. I, I, you know, I'm not being a pompous ass, but you know, in 2005, I wasn't particularly enamoured with the England cricket team rocking up to number ten, half pissed, and mm. I, I wanted us to win the Ashes, like everyone else was glad. But then I wanted us to accept it and price it into, yeah, we won the Ashes because we should have won the Ashes rather than turning it into a national holiday and mm. going off to the number number ten Downing Street with Kevin Peterson looking like a skunk, um, and and everyone drunk as a skunk. But you had this situation with Peterson there was all there was a situation with Peterson there were there seems to be division in the camp there seems to be the swan side of the camp there seems to be the Peterson side of the camp there's this allegation about you and others with this parody account of taking the piss out of Kevin Peterson 
um, that you had the passwords to that account. So you must have been behind some of that Mickey taking or parodying. Walk me through the Kevin Peterson story. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one because he's one of the best players I've ever played with. Like the 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 flair and ability that he he had. He played a hundred Test matches for England. You know, England mm. legend. Ultimately, I mean, I spend a lot of time with Kev now, like now with with Sky and commentary, and just been up playing golf around him in Scotland. He, he's, I'm getting on great with him, you know. And I think the me, I must admit, great. Uh, but I'm talking about then. Yeah, but I, I think the media, like like how you mentioned there, Camp Swan, and I feel like it, it always got built up a lot more as division within the press as it did within. The changing room, um, you know. I think when I look back, KP ended up getting sacked, right? Which yeah. is the only what was that? 2014 by Strauss. Yes, was mm. it? Um, and I, I, I went into a selection meeting. I was captain of the T20 team at the time. But it felt to me as an outside, it looked like he deserved to be sacked. Yeah. So I don't have that belief because I, I don't. You can drop players, but what's the point of sacking them? Really, you know. There's the, you know. If you feel like a player's performance is not, oh yeah, but someone has shit pulled. I mean, I'm a Kevin Peterson admirer. I like Mavericks. Do you like Mavericks? Yeah. But some of the stuff that Kevin got involved with, whether it's text to the opposition parodying the England, that can't be good for anybody, can it? No, that, yeah, but so I sat in this this um, meeting with with the selectors, and as a T20 captain, he was a captain, not a selector, yeah. but you can have a view. Yeah. So the managing director at the time when so Kevin, he's been, he's been opening the batting for us leading into a World Cup. We're going to Bangladesh. So he he's played every game or most games, and like ready for us to go. Kevin Peters won't be selected, so I'm captain going. Well, I want the best team in the World Cup, and that includes him. Why why is he not being selected? We've made a decision to move on from him. I said, well, okay, so that that's come a bit from maybe Andy Flower, who mm. uh, you know they didn't get on as coach and player. But the, the white ball team was Ashley Giles was head coach and Giles got on great with Kev. So I think we're both along the lines of, well, we want him. You know, it, let's play this World Cup. And if you make a decision after that, selfishly, yeah. I want my best player to be at this World Cup. And it was a, just a non-starter. We're not having him. And that surprised me. And that that made me feel like, because I, I had no idea that they were going to sack him. You know, that was my first sort of, why is he not available? Are we going to move him on? why you know a bit like what's the point and that was probably my a, a realization for me that sometimes politics takes over sport right do you know what i mean yeah because yeah. really the reality of if you're the captain or coach we'd be saying we want our best player and someone's going you can't have him why in that t20 i'm not saying he was the best player in the test match side at the time the t20 side he was a gun for us kevin was very critical about your bowlers wasn't he he talked about the power and the balance of power in the dressing room was with the bowlers. You're doing well, but the bowlers seem to have the biggest say, the most input, and not all of it's great at times. Yeah, I don't remember seeing much of that, but it, 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 I think I certainly he never mentioned that in the change. He talks room. about it in, 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 in it, conjunction with book? bullying. Yeah, he's Peterson on bullying. So the bowlers were given so much power, they were doing really well, but these guys ran the dressing room, and that was. You were one of the guys he was talking Swanee, about. Swanee, Jimmy. Yeah, and you. Yeah, I mean, in what sense? I suppose that would be my, you know, I think that was probably, was that I think I remember him talking about like misfielding, whether we were a bit too sort of overpowering with Yeah, with, that was with the specifics he was referring to. And obviously his relationship with Andy Flowers is not a good one, is it? No, because he uh, talks about his response to Andy Flowers' regime, but I'm not one of those you tell to jump, right? Yeah, I, I, and, I don't and, jump. and Andy, uh, it'd be a really interesting one to to look at now because I think Andy got to number one in the world, but he was a it was a an aggressive style of coaching. It was this is how we play, you know, this is what we do, this is how we train. And didn't strike a great chord with Kev, who you're right, is a is a maverick, he wants to do it his own way, he wants to play in a style that he wants to play in. If he wants to try and hit a hit a six He's going at a six, not sit within the structure of the so team. It would be it, lovely for baseball now, wouldn't well, it? Well, I be said perfect, that to him it? last week. Honestly, yeah. I, he would be be so interesting to see how he got managed 
away from that particular style of management. Like we said, we did mention earlier, didn't we? You sometimes come into situations where a manager doesn't fancy you or doesn't suit your style of play. It doesn't work for you as a player. I think a Trevor Bayliss who came after in terms of 15 and particularly a Baz would have got, would the have seen him. Oh, I, I, I think yeah. he'd have been an absolute phenomenon. Yeah. And I think the public would have enjoyed him more because he'd have been a freer man playing. I think how he maybe felt, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think how he felt maybe under the regime of this is how we play, this is what we do, the structure. Yeah, he pushed against that, it. That he pushed against that yeah. slightly. So, and in tiny little ways that mean nothing and don't matter at all. So, what Baz will say is turn up in an England, something with an England badge on on match day. So it doesn't really matter what you're, yeah. you don't have to be so strict. Yeah, it's not a stricture. It's not Whereas strict guidelines. In yeah. that era, like, if they said no flip flops, Kev would turn up in flip flops. Yeah. Little tiny little things that's yeah. just a bit of a elbows out, which some people um, found frustrating mm -hmm. against the overriding, the overall thing. But I, I would love to. Yeah, he, he, struck, he, he did really well under Duncan Fletcher, who was that sort of Trevor Bayliss yeah. type. Go and play. Go and do your thing. And I would love to have seen KP. KP. But it seems like a failing with Kevin then to have got to. You put him in for a reason. You knew what he was when you put him in. Then surely there was an em an emphasis on making sure that the environment was fit for his style of management and coaching and leadership. But, but that is not that coaching, not, but is leadership. that not leadership though? Like if you're leading a changing room, do, how how do you man management is adapting the whole culture for everyone to suit. Yeah. Whereas, that, whereas I would but say, without being critical yeah. of that environment, because we got to the best team in the world, yeah. only ever time England had been there, it was fit in or fuck off it in a sense, without, sorry to swear, but it was like, you bowl this way, you go under 2.5 and over, like we said, or you're, out. or you're out. Yeah. So there was not a lot of flair. There wasn't a lot of like maneuverability within the structure of how the team played. And there's loads of other sports teams that have been a bit like that with great success. I don't think there's major longevity in that. I think that's a three, four year yeah, period. It's a moment in time, yeah. It's stressful. It's tiring. It's yeah. in monotonous, training. It's yeah. monotonous. monotonous it's, yeah. it's training every day like you. It's, it's regimented, isn't it? Regimented. It doesn't allow for any flair or flamboyance or an individual expression. It's a discipline which works for some but not for others. So, so towards the end, I remember there was a moment KP got caught at mid on at the Wacker in Perth and it really upset the coaches because it came across like it was a bit of a an irresponsible thing irresponsible yeah. thing whereas baz would say why didn't you do it for six what's next for you you've got an interesting life you've um you're a new father but like me i'm the oldest father in the playground but you but you i've got a little uh, two and a three year old now you've just had a baby girl baby girl annabella 11 months yeah fantastic um yeah game changer isn't it yeah and yeah. probably played a little part in in me moving on from the game a little bit, to yeah, be honest, I think um, different priorities, slightly different priorities. Do I want to be three, four months away in hotel rooms on yeah. different side I'm, of the world? I'm missing out, I'm missing out yeah. because ultimately, one thing that a lot of people always tell me is your kids are only small once, and mm. you know those first four years are so special and so incredible. Um, but you've not embraced the uh, uh, the celebrity lifestyle. You've, you've got a child with a a well-known pop singer. I don't see you popping up in celebrity environments. Please tell me that you're not going to be doing Strictly Come Dancing and stuff like that. Uh, I That's did, not uh, the direction I, you're going I, in, are you? No, I, I, I didn't. I didn't go down the route of of uh, dancing. I'm six foot six. I think anyone who's six foot six is mm. is a risky business dancing. Peter Crouch tried it on the pitch and wasn't didn't great, work. Was it? No. Uh, no, we're both. To be honest, we you know we we we're both quite private people. We both we both really our, our favourite. Evenings are in our joggers, watching, having a nice meal, watching telly at home. We, we love spending time together and and doing very very normal things. And um, I think you always you always at your heart, you know you know you found the right person that that you're at your happiest doing the most basic of things. You know I don't feel like we need to be doing really flashy things to have enjoyment together. We just but it's um, also interesting, isn't it? Because it's quite nice when you've got somebody that's achieve things in their own right, understands the landscape of being in the public domain. Yeah, I it's spent, an interesting one. I spent it? the first 30 years of my life being Chris Broad's son. And right. I've spent the last eight years being Molly King's partner. <laughs>
Is that right? So I have no definition of myself. Okay. <laughs> no, it, it, um, I think what, I mean, she really aided me, to be honest, in my... in my. You don't believe that though, do you, by the way? Well, no. Um, not the Chris Broads bit, anyway. Um, no, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, she really aided me. Like, she was a great support throughout throughout the, the back end of my, my cricketing career. She, you know, she was in the Saturdays for a long period of time and then that ended so she had to have a change of career so that's you know we talk a lot about me moving away mm. from the cricket game and and uh understanding that uh, it's quite a tough thing that i've never really talked about it publicly but understanding that you're not going to find those that elation those highs yeah the same yeah even if those highs are forty thousand people singing you're a wanker yeah you know the it's, cheering, unique, isn't it? the, it's unique isn't the it? being on the pitch don't chase that because it ain't coming last question for you Stuart. Um, I suppose taking the final wicket to win at the Oval in the fifth test of a series that could have gone to be the ultimate series in terms of the greatest sporting comeback, as you've said yourself. How perfect was that for you as that's all, folks? I had such a unique uh, feeling, actually, when I, when I, uh, I, I had it because Stokes, he came to me when I was running on, I bowled four or five overs, wasn't really working for me. I hadn't created much, a few player misses. And he said, this is going to be a last over. I want to bring Mark Wood on for the extra pace, mm -hmm. which is a decision I agreed with. Mm -hmm. So I was like, yep, yeah, sound. That's good of you. So I know, yeah. So I know this is my last ever over in professional cricket. And uh, run into bowl of, you know, five balls, feel fine. And got a player miss. And I thought I did that sort of, bail trick you know i just turned the bales over as a you know i'd done i'd done it and the crowd gave me a bit of a roar and walking back to my mark i'm like this is my last ever ball my legs went really? like jelly Did honestly they? like yeah. like pure jelly and i bear in mind i've bowled tens of thousands of balls and my legs went pure jelly to the extent that i was at the end of my mark going i'm not sure i can put one in front of the other here this is weird i know i've done this i've loved doing this for so long this is going to be my last ever one and i just said in my mind make this a great ball yeah. like hit the pitch move the ball away i didn't in my mind i wasn't going don't bowl a full toss and get hit for four but i was going make your last one a good one yeah like run in with energy whack the pitch and just just make sure it's good from your point and as i released the ball and he nicked it i just couldn't believe that mm. you know I, I pure elation i was like something's looked after me there I, all the fielders are on the boundary because the the tail ender was on strike and um, so I had no one to celebrate with. I was looking around like no one's around. They're all 60 meters away. And I eventually, I think Jimmy caught up with me and gave me a big hug. But that got me the final over. That got mm -hmm. me another over because there were eight down. Yeah. So uh, I got that wicket with my fight, which I knew was my final ball. But getting that wicket meant I got a chance Never to have another go. And then I, I had no nerves. I had no feeling of legs going like jelly. I just ran in and, and bowled and, and got the got the wicket. Uh, and it was amazing that it was caught Johnny Bairstow as well, because that the night before I announced on the Saturday, so the Sunday night, um, Johnny walked back through the hotel reception. I'd had dinner with Jimmy Anderson and Alistair Cook, actually. And uh, Johnny had his tiny little baby and, and wife with him. And he said, Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? I said, go on. He goes, final wicket will be Bob Broad caught Bairstow. And I went, oh, nice. God, we can yeah. dream. You know, I said it was a joke because he was getting the lift. We can dream, mate. And he took it, and that meant more to him taking that final mm -hmm. catch as well as much as it did yeah. to me taking the final wicket. And I, you know, I've not properly watched it back, um, but I remember Johnny like falling to his knees and like throwing the ball in the air and pumping it. And and ultimately, what really hit me through moving on from the game, I'm not an emotional character. I'm quite factual. Mm -hmm. I sort of you know, I'm except when you write articles. <laughs> yeah, um, but the next morning, I saw a clip. Uh, of the fans it filmed from the stands yeah and the eruption of emotion and that made me emotional i was like, made you feel very proud it was like yeah you play sport really for yeah of course for the determination the drive yeah. the winning the feeling the, the the emotions it give you but also to make people happy and to see yeah. the happiness those people the, the fans being happy for me yeah and for the team winning really like but that relationship through. they have with you that value that they had in you and that feeling of their exhilaration on behalf of your achievements yeah. is something special, isn't it? Very, very. Perfect end. 
the perfect end. Stuart Paul, thank you so very much for being up front with me. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Up Front with me, Simon Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. Future episodes can be found on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly.